when I was first kind of getting to grips with the arms trade when I started working for CAT. For, for, what really surprised me was the scale of the institutional support that's given by government ministers, that's given by civil servants. And the government isn't just an observer of the arms trade, which is how it likes to kind of paint itself. We'll always hear about the government regulating the industry, but it's actually a very active participant in the industry. And the arms dealers admit that themselves. Um, one of BAE's heads of parliamentary engagement, when he was speaking to a subcommittee in 2016, said that it's impossible to do a major arms deal without the fundamental support of government behind it. Um, and so in that sense, the, the government's deeply implicated in what happens. There's a whole department of the civil service, the defense and security organization, which is 100 civil servants whose sole job it is, is to maximize arms sales. They'll work with, um, they'll work with uh, arms company heads. They'll specifically negotiate on the behalf of arms companies. So you have this really strange situation where government is regulating an industry which government is also actively promoting. So whenever there is, a tension which comes up for government between arms company profits and human rights will almost always <coughs> put profits ahead of uh, human rights and profits ahead of human lives. Now the arms industry is obviously global but most of the sources, I, most of the readings which I've picked for this week are very specific to the UK and the reason for that is because I think that the patterns we see in the UK are indicative of how any major arms dealing uh, government works. The reason for that is because the UK government is one of the biggest arms dealers in the world. If we look at the government's own reports, which come out every year, they rank, it ranks itself as the second biggest arms export from the world behind the United States. And its arms are doing an absolutely huge amount of damage. Nowhere is this clearer than in Yemen, where right now, Saudi personnel who have been trained by the UK armed forces are flying UK made fighter jets, dropping UK made bombs and firing UK made missiles. This is a war which could not be happening without the fundamental support of the UK and the US. And the Saudi example is such a strong and such a horrible one, which is why I chose reading two, which was the Guardian piece, the Saudis couldn't do it without us by Aaron Merritt. Now, Aaron is a friend and I think he might be joining us later uh, this evening actually. But I think it's fair to say that this is one of, the, one of the strongest and one of the best researched overviews I've ever read of the UK arms industry. It's a case study in the callousness and the complicity of Downing Street and really embodies for me just how cosy that relationship is between uh, Downing Street BAE systems and the uh, Saudi regime. Now the piece quotes John Deverell, who is the former Director of Defence Diplomacy at the Ministry of Defence. Very much, an, very much an insider. And what he said was, we are worried that if we do speak truth to power, we will endanger the commercial relationship. Now that's a really interesting perspective to get from someone who was so ingrained in the system. I would slightly query the extent to which the UK government would have any desire to speak truth to power. But the fact that such an admission is coming from someone who was so high up in that system itself tells you about the problems of groupthink and the totally um, distorted priorities, which are driving so much of the arms trade and so much of the relationship between the UK and Saudi Arabia in this case. Because it's not just a military relationship, it's also a deeply political relationship because arms sales aren't apolitical. When you sell somebody weapons, you're not just selling them the means to kill, you're also selling them the political support and legitimacy which goes with it. And many of the failings of the arms trade are moral failings, such as the ones that are outlined in this piece, but there are also very systematic failings which are so built into the system, which is why I chose reading three, which was Dereliction of Duty, how weak arms export license controls in the UK facilitated corruption and exacerbated instability in the Niger Delta, which is a very long title, but a very good report by Margot Gibbs. Um, it's a fascinating case study of what looks a lot like corruption, um, but also highlights a system that fails to ask any of the right questions. What this report does is it focuses on an extremely dubious deal which took place between a Norwegian company which sold disused naval vessels to a shell company run by the former leader of an armed militant group in Nigeria. The company was linked to um, Tom Polo who was at the time one of the most wanted men in Nigeria who had already threatened to overthrow the government if he didn't support the result of the upcoming election. Now, the, ship, the ships had left Norway, but they'd been docked in the UK in Ramsgate, um, and they were there for a few weeks, for a few months, which meant that they needed to get a separate license. Now, what this meant was that 
it wasn't just the Norwegian government, it was also the UK government. Somehow two different governments managed to approve this terrible sale. And the report makes clear that a large part of it was that civil servants simply did not undertake sufficient due diligence before agreeing the export. And I think that tells us so much about how the system works. It tells us so much about how there's an inbuilt assumption of saying yes to um, possible deals as they come up. And it wasn't as if Brit anyone in Britain actually profited from the deal, which in some respects makes it, makes it all the more bizarre, because it wasn't even a straightforward corruption case. It was a case of arms controls simply not doing what we're always told that they're meant to do. And now the question of whether the vessels could be used to increase pensions was only given very cursory consideration before being dismissed. Now, when the vessels were seized by the Nigerian authorities, by that point they had been armed up and were potentially going to be used in uh, violence. So it was a total case of systematic failure. But of course, it's not just civil servants and government ministers who make up the arms industry, it's also workers. And unfortunately, some of the most skilled engineers in this country, some of the most skilled engineers in the world, are involved in the production of arms. And the impact of these sales can be utterly catastrophic, but that doesn't stop us from constantly hearing the argument. I'm sure you've all heard it as well, that, these job, that, the, that the arms trade is vital because it creates jobs and it's strong for the economy. And that's why I chose Reading 4, which was, a piece from Middle East Eye by Arif Ullah called Made in Britain Tested on Yemenis, the reality of working for the bomb makers. And I thought this is a really strong piece of reporting. Um, Arif is a very good journalist and this saw him visiting and spending time with arms industry workers in uh, Lancashire, it was specifically workers who were involved in making uh, many of the fighter jets which are being used in Yemen. Now, he doesn't at any point ever stray from the moral implications of the work they're doing, but what he does do is explore very well the reasons why people do it. And what comes through is that the workers are very clearly aware of the impact, with one of them saying to him, you see the children in Yemen starving on the 10 o'clock news, but you try not to pay attention and just get on with it. And what comes through is that a lot of workers do it because arms companies offer skilled jobs in areas with, without a vast amount of other options. And this gets summed up by a quote, which comes from one of the workers who says, there's nothing we can do. We're, ca we're caved in, making it impossible to work anywhere else because we've all got specific skills. And I'm going to come on to the, how, we should, how we should think about responding to that. But I actually want to highlight reading five at this point, because it was in a very similar vein. It was making a killing inside the Scottish town built on the Arm Street, which is by Aaron Merritt, who I'm uh, reference earlier who also wrote the second reading and this provides a, this provides a deeper dive than reading for and it focuses specifically on the impact of uh, a Raytheon factory in Glenrothes. Now Glenrothes is a small town in Scotland, um, it's not a very wealthy town um, and this town and Raytheon employs 600 people making it one of the biggest local employers, I think the only employer bigger than it in the areas of the council. And I thought what this piece did was it does a really good job of contextualising the economic situation which faces Glenrothes and lots of other towns across the UK. Now, none of this is to excuse the consequences of what these weapons do, but the piece does a very good job of exploring how and why people work for these companies that do so much damage. Um, there's a quote Aaron gives from one worker who said that there are few people who can live entirely by their principles. It is a trade-off between being, if it is a trade-off between being a husband or a wife versus your belief, whatever it is. Sometimes you've got to say that my family comes first. I can't just walk away. Now I think this feels like an attitude which is very hard when, to deal with when confronted with it. And I think it also feels quite reflective of how a lot of people see the industry. I think a lot of people see it as a necessary evil. And every single time I've ever done a media interview about the arms trade, we're always asked a question about jobs. Whenever um, you'll see the arms industry representatives on telly or government ministers talking about it, they'll always refer to jobs as well. Um, he also quotes another worker who said um, somewhat more crudely, personally, I don't give it a moment's thought. If the Arabs want to kill one another, that's their business. We just sell the weapons, we don't pull the trigger which for me embodies the depersonalized immorality, the racism and the lack of care for human life. It's also very key to the arms industry. It's not an argument which government ministers would make out loud, but it is the logic behind much of the arms industry. And if we didn't do it, somebody else would, and at the end of the day, it's up to these people and so on and so forth. And it's that horrible view which has also helped to keep the industry alive for um, so long. Um, now, both of these 
pieces which I've referenced all really highlight the need for campaigners and organisations like CAT to be thinking about the alternatives that we offer and how the transition could look. Um, and I think it is well worth us stressing that so much of this is based on myths. The arms, arms exports account for roughly about 0.2% of jobs in the economy, but in areas like Glen Office and parts of Lancashire, it is a very big employer. And when we're thinking about um, government pushing other areas of engineering, such as renewable energy, we should be very strongly arguing for those areas, for new areas of work and engineering to be focused in places which currently employ arms industry workers in large numbers because that's where a lot of the skills are and we want to see those skills being put into a positive into positive areas of engineering which can create a greener safer world rather than one which creates a vastly more dangerous one but of course the biggest victims of the arms trade are not the workers and that's why I chose Reading 6, which was 10 years on, and eyewitnesses described the aftermath of the first Pakistani drone strike, which is a piece by an excellent journalist called Alice Ross. Um, and it's a really powerful witness account. Um, well, it's a series of accounts, actually, of a strike that was, at the time, deemed relatively uncontroversial, and in many cases, it was celebrated. Um, and it was the first of uh, many drone strikes on uh, Pakistan, which over time have become so much more normalised for so many people, um, unfortunately normalised for people who are in Pakistan, but also have just become almost a kind of almost banal part of a lot of conversation about um, foreign policy and uh, treated as something which is deemed to be quite normal now. Um, but I think what this article does is it really highlights the lack of humanity, but also highlights the distinct lack of accountability and the distinct lack of care in the system. The article quotes an amnesty source in saying it's really symbolic that in the very first drone strike we have, yes, a militant was killed, but also civilians. And yet after 10 years, there's no justice, no acknowledgement for those civilians. And that's ultimately what is uh, one of the things which is at the heart of the arms trade. It's an industry like war. You don't hear about the many civilians who die in war. And a, a specific case which comes to mind on that front is also the bombing of a school bus which happened in Yemen in 2018, um, which killed about 50 children. And we don't know what those children's names were. Their faces have never been shown on national television, but their lives are worth just as much as every other life. And their stories were never told. Um, and at, even after that horrific incident, the Saudi regime dismissed it as just a mistake, as if this mistake had been cost free in some respect. But actually, these are people's lives. They're not just statistics. Um, and of course, none of this would be possible without the workers who um, were quoted in readings three and four, or without the complicity and support and aggression of military powers. In that case, it was the US, but it will be the UK in many other cases. And finally, that kind of brings me on to reading seven, which was actually a film. Um, now, Shadow World is the name of, the, of an excellent book, which is written by a former South African politician called Andrew Feinstein, but it's also the name of the film. The film isn't quite an adaptation of the book, but it does cover a lot of the same ground. And it brings a lot of the themes together and gives a really good overview of the industry. I think it's actually also a te uh, um, text for some of the other reading groups which are coming up. So I would definitely recommend it as, a, I'd recommend the film as a very accessible introduction. The book is a very long one. So if you're intending to read that, I'd put aside quite a few days for it. But ultimately, I hope you've had the chance to read at least some of the sources. And I'd recommend all of them for the different reasons which I've given. Um, I look forward to the discussions we're going to have and talking about them in more detail. Um, I think that they all offer different perspectives and different reflections on the arms trade and its uh, deadly impact. In the weeks that follow, we'll be exploring some of these issues in greater detail and seeing how they intersect with other areas. But I think for tonight, I'm certainly, this evening, I'm looking very, I'm very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts and discussing uh, more of these points. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope this has been a useful introduction.